All right, welcome to another edition of The Extra Point. I am Kendall Gammon. This is my former teammate, Lawrence Tynes. Lawrence, I appreciate you taking time. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know what? Uh, we go way back. I mean, yeah. you were in camp a couple years. Mm -hmm. um, 2000. 2000, and, and didn't make it. Then you went overseas and played there, and then came back. And we were teammates, I believe, for three years. Is that right? Yeah, three I was years? here. So 2000 is my, 01, I want to say, was my original undrafted year right i signed as a free agent um went to camp got cut and then subsequently went to europe the following year yep came back to camp got mm -hmm. cut and then i went to canada for two years so yeah we were together i felt like i was a chief for a long time right but i exactly. really kind of wasn't because yeah I play. it is it is kind of amazing you know my uh it's called the extra point it involves a snap and i have my snap principles which is set goals notice strengths accept accountability and practice persistence and we can go some over uh, go over some of those as we talk but you know the one that, that jumps out to me right away um is persistence i mean getting to the league i mean you went uh, a route that not a lot go yeah, you know, we came in at a time, I did anyway, where it was tough to get in. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot of long-term kickers mm -hmm. playing, and um, these coaches did not trust young guys, right. it felt like. And so I did well in Europe. I did well, really well in Canada. I made the all-pro team. Um, so I, they really just kind of wanted to see someone do it on a professional stage. Right. So I knew I was going to just have to kind of go prove my worth. And then ultimately – it was a good thing because when my, after my second year in Canada, I literally had nine legitimate options with money on the table. Wow. So almost a third of the league um, offered me a contract with money up front. Of course, I came back to Kansas City because right. I was comfortable here. Yep. Coach Vermeil was here. Yep. You were here. Um, guys I was familiar with. So um, it just made perfect sense. Talk about, you know, I, I always talk about when I was uh, in college and getting ready to be drafted or a free agent, it never occurred to me that I wouldn't fail. It was the mindset that I had. And, and I'm very big on that, uh, not only the mindset, but how you talk to yourself, the self-talk. Just how did you approach things? Uh, I mean, you've been cut or you didn't make the team. You're, you're all over the place. What kept you going? What was that inner drive for you? I knew I could do it. Um, I, it <laughs> As you know, there's 32 jobs in the world. Right. You had one of them for a very long time. There's 32 snappers, 32 kickers, 32 punters. It, I mean, that's that's one of the toughest jobs in the world to get. Yeah. Uh, you're just. I just wasn't ready. I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I could do it because I competed against guys that had done it for many years, and I felt like I could do it. It right. just timing is everything, mm -hmm. and so. I was just going to keep, you know, waiting out, figuring it out, biding my time and waiting for the right opportunity. And ultimately, as you know, in this league, when they give you money of some sort, I don't care if it's two hundred thousand dollars. That's a legitimate statement that right. hey, they we really we're going to give you a fair shake at this. Mm -hmm. And so Morton was, you know, I don't know, 45 at the time. So mm -hmm. and I had competed against him and thought I did OK, but um, I needed to get a little more consistent. So and that's what I did in Canada. Right. So when I came back, I was really, really confident that I could beat him out. Okay, so um, maybe backtracking a little bit more. I remember uh, going into my fifth year with the Steelers. I made the team, and then I was cut the next day. They got a, uh, a tight end who could a long snap also. Of course, mm -hmm. he could not, as we found out later on. But I remember how disconcerting that was for me um, and, and how I, you know, I, I dealt with a low point there. I, it was a matter of hours, and then I was on a plane to New Orleans, and mm -hmm. my career uh, continued. But how did you handle the disappointment uh, each time? Was it just that belief in yourself and what you could do? Yeah, I never really got down. Um, yeah. I just looked at it like, you know what? It just wasn't the right time. Mm -hmm. Because it, I think if you lay everything out on the line, you you give everything your worth, you, you put everything that you've you've done over your career on the field. I mean, you, you can't be mad at yourself. And right. I wasn't, I was never mad at myself. I right. mean, sure, if, you, if maybe you missed one in preseason game or something like that, but... I just gave it everything I had, and believe it or not, like when I got back from Canada, if I didn't make it that year, I was done. Really? Yeah, I had set a line. I mean, I was 25 years old. True. It, it was. It, it, listen, I've seen a lot of guys that can kick in the NFL come into camp and compete against me, but they didn't beat me out. But there's a lot of guys out there right. that have the talent if they stick to it. But ultimately, at some time, point, you got to make a decision. Yep. You know, do I want to keep making ten grand a year? <laughs> exactly right, and so, deal with this this roller coaster ride. Yeah, but uh, I have a huge belief in myself. Obviously, I think that's why I had a, a career like I did. But um, 
it, I never wavered. I never really thought I wasn't going to make it. I don't right. know why. I just It just never crept into my head. I knew I was going to play in the NFL. That's pretty cool. Now let's go back a little bit to, to high school. You know, I talk about notice strengths. That's one of them as well. And not only the physical strengths, but the emotional strengths. It sounds like you have that emotional strength that's been built up through the years. But somebody had to notice. I mean, you were a soccer player. Then somebody said, you know what? You ought to try out as a kicker. Just talk about how that went and how you came to start playing football. Yeah, so uh, my PE teacher, uh, Mike McMillan, was the defense coordinator. And the team needed a kicker, and, and I was in PE. And I was a good athlete in school. I was relatively small until, like, my junior year. I mean, I was, like, 5'3", five, 5'4". Five, oh, really? Yeah, so you had and an then expert my then. junior year, I was 6'1". So I grew, like, a foot almost. Wow. And so I was always a great athlete. I was just too small to play football, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So my junior year, I go out. He takes me out into the field, the baseball field, and says, hey, can you kick this ball? So we kicked the ball, and I literally never stopped kicking from that point on. Like, if it wasn't for Mike McMillan, I don't know if I would have ever kicked. I mean, he literally took me out, and, and God rest his soul, he's passed away since uh, in a bad car accident. But if it wasn't for him, I, I truly probably would have never went out there. Um, but then I ended up playing safety. Right. And then I kicked, and I love the game, and I love the sport. Um, but... It's weird how it all worked out. That, that is, you know, for me, many, many people think, oh, you must have been snapping since yeah. you were a little kid. And for me, no, I, I got caught my third year in college snapping because I was curious how it worked. And a coach recognized that strength in me. And at the time, I wanted nothing to do with it because you know, I was a lot bigger, we'll say fatter maybe. And I didn't want to run down, yeah. run down and cover kicks. But, you know, lo and behold, two, two years later, I'm getting drafted to the NFL. So you and I have a, a lot in common in terms of really to a degree, each and every time that we're out there on the field, we hold the fate of the team somewhat in our hands in terms of either going to score points or not going to score mm. points. Um, how did you deal with it throughout your career? Um, I took a, obviously I, I knew the responsibility right. entrusted in us when we went you out You accept there. accountability. Um, you take responsibility. For ultimately, yours. Yeah. there's a lot of, there's two things going on. The offense failed. Right. And so here we come and they better, you better get three. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I just try to compartmentalize that stuff. Like I, I was never too big into thinking about the result. Right. I never thought about the result. I just thought about the process. So interesting. That's a um, that's a John Wooden thing where he says, yeah. don't, "Don't focus on winning. Focus on doing your job yeah, to because, the best of your ability." Because there's so many things that have to happen before I get the points. Right. And so, I, I was so focused on three steps back, two steps over. Tell myself, "Hey, head down, follow through." And then obviously, you guys had all your deals. Right. And so, you, sure, you want to make all of them, but um, it's kind of weird. I I really never gave a shit if I missed. I just didn't. Um, it, it's probably what propelled me. I, I didn't. I never tried to miss, right? You never, right, exactly. So like, right. I, so I, when I missed, I just had this insane ability to just kind of go. I'll get the next one. Right. Um, which I think helped me. I, I would agree. I mean, my, my mantra was always one snap clear. And, mm -hmm. and also that I, I always said, you know, I was paid not to be perfect every time. I was paid to be consistent. And sure. if it didn't go right this time, I was paid to do it right the next time. And always, you know, one snap and clear and make sure and not let this one bad issue, whatever, affect the rest of the game or the rest of my career. Yeah. Sounds like that, how, how you went about it. It, it was. And, um, you know, I think in today's game and even probably when I Play. there's guys that think of all the things that can happen when you're kicking but you can't control that right um all you can control is what because there's a there's a there's a lineman there's a, a snapper and a holder your job is to get to the ball and kick and make it i get that right. it's not always going to be perfect but you know with you and and anyone i ever had holding you snapping it was damn near perfect every time so you kind of ran out of excuses to tell yourself if you screwed up but it it, it just was something I was really good at, just moving on to the next kick. That's very cool. Now, I know you're a big golfer, and in, in golf you talk about taking the, the same swing every, thing, every time. Uh, you know, for me, I tried to look at every snap as, I mean, whether it was a game winner or whether it was in the first quarter, it was still eight yards. It was still three and a half revolutions. Mm -hmm. It was still laces out and all of that. Is that how you looked at it also? Was it, it's, it's the same swing every, every time? Well, that and then, you know, I, I think the one thing where we benefit is, is specialists get to do the exact same thing in practice that they're going to do in games. Right. And, and position players don't because we don't know what the other team's going to throw at you or True. the wrinkles. We know the uprights are 18 feet, six inches wide. Right. We know how high they are. We know where the hash marks are. Mm -hmm. So I... Part of that is what makes the position really mundane, but because it's the same thing every day. But we had the the tools at practice to to really be perfect. Right. So yeah, I mean it's. I, I just think 
what we did was so specialized right. and um, somewhat unique, but I loved the heck out of it. Yep. I mean, I loved the monotony of it, but mm -hmm. I also, I, I loved being the only guy. Like, everyone was staring at us when we kicked. I yeah. loved it. I, I mean, it's... You either rise or you fall. Mm -hmm. you, you either rise to the occasion or go, yeah. go down, right? Yeah, because, you, as you know, people say, well, you know, I get it. They're like, they're like how did you do that? Right. And, and it's funny because I'm six years removed from the game now. I get nervous now watching guys kick. Right. And so I'm like... You know, I was I, I knew how I did it because I was trained and mentally and physically to do it. But I get more nervous now watching guys kick than I ever did when I played. That's that's interesting. I, I know for me, uh, I never tried to get too high or too too yeah. low. People ask, do you get geeked up? Or no, I didn't. No. I mean, really, I was even loose in, in pregame. It was like five minutes when when you're kicking the ball off. That's when I'm like, okay, I, I'm in game mode. Mm -hmm. I know one thing that I tried to do. I'm curious how you looked at it. After I warmed up maybe a couple quick snaps uh, on field goal or punt, I treated every uh, every rep like it was a game rep. So when I got into the game, it just felt like everything was the same way. Were you were you similar similar in that way or? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, even throughout the week. I mean, yeah, that's what. I, yeah, that's me. what I'm talking I, yeah, about. Yeah, I. I mean, as you know, when your teammates are watching you. Mm -hmm. You want to make every kick. You want to be perfect on snaps, holds, it, the whole thing. Our, our, Coach Quinn said it, and Coach Gans used to say, you want to be great in front of your teammates. Yeah. Because, we, obviously, we don't do the same things they do in terms of physical. Mm -hmm. But you just want to want them to have trust in you. Right. right. Because then that permeates through you and then the rest of the team. But I, I really did. I took every rep, even when I was warming up on a Wednesday practice. Yes. Like it was – because, it, again, it's – this. It's mental. The whole position is mental. It's really, you know, I talk about emotional strength and and how you look at things. I mean, the uh, what you the meaning that you assign to something is ultimately the meaning that it gives. And it's if you say it's good, then it's going to be good. If it's bad, it's going to be bad. And and I think that's huge. You know, people, I, I experienced it through through my life. Um, people are like, oh man, you long snapper. That must be a that must be a great gig. Well, it, it is if you can handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can ha because. We're, we're both aware there's pressure there, but if you handle it the right way, then yes, it is a great gig. If you don't, that's where I think you see the guys fizzle out. We all know that we hear about kickers and punters and long snappers sometimes being a little bit different breed sometimes, but I've always said, well, some of them are, and those are the guys that don't play the long time. The guys that I would say are normal, that get along with everybody, that have a long career, they have a long career because they are normal. I mean, mm -hmm. yourself, you know, Morton, myself, you had Zach Diossi. Yeah. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Do you think that's a, a, a fair statement? I think if you embed yourself amongst your teammates, meaning I do all the running, just like you did. Yeah. We do all the running in mm -hmm. the offseason with whoever's working out that day, the positions, the wide receivers, the DBs, the D-line. Right. you got to earn the respect of your teammates. Yep. And so I never even – thought not to do that yep. like it and never it never occurred that that's not how you act yeah because I when I played on a football team in high school I played defense I played with my teammate like I did everything I was never going to be the guy who stood off to the side and said you know what I'm a kicker yeah got to rest my legs right um I did all the lifting all the agility drills everything anyone on the football team did yep. I I did because that's going to earn you some credit when you do miss a big kick. Right. Because they're not going to look at the guy and say, hey, oh, my God, this guy sucks. He stands on his, you know, yeah, off to the side. side all day. This guy's one of us. Right. He screwed up just like they know they screw up from time mm -hmm. to time. And so you got to build and earn that trust with your teammates. You know, it's interesting. You probably don't know this. The first year that I came to Kansas City, or the, the second year I was there when Vermeil came, you know, have you ha have an entrance uh, uh, interview with the coach mm -hmm. when, when he's new and whatever. When I walked in to talk with him um, in the offseason before the first year of coaching, before I sat down, he said, Kendall, I just want you to know I don't want you here. I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, why is that? He said, well, he goes, you do a good job snapping, but I want somebody who can play a backup position and save a roster spot too. And at that time, I remember <laughs> I, I sat down and I breathed a little bit uh, easier. And I said, well, you know what, coach, um, just so you know, uh, those people don't exist and I am going to be here. And as I, and kind of ballsy at the time, uh, conversation didn't last much longer, but I'll say this, when I came in at the end of the year, because I did make the team, uh, before I sat down that time, he's like, Kendall, I apologize. I have not seen somebody in your position lead like uh, you've led. And, and really, 
that story comes to mind because that's what you're telling me what you did. Just because you're in a specialized position, you didn't think that you were different or could do anything any different than anybody else. You, as you said, embedded yourself into the team and you led from, I won't say below, but you led from a position uh, that was on par with everybody else. Yeah, I was always, when I left here, I was a young player here, but when I got to New York, I was, there was like eight players on the leadership council with, that met with Coach Coughlin every week and I was one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't matter your position and it doesn't matter if you're a starter. Right. Um, people lead different ways and as long as you do what everyone else is doing and then, you know, just basically shut up and go to work. Right. Uh, that's the ultimate respect in the locker room. You know, right. there's people that talk and we get that, um, but there's so also people that don't say anything Right. And people have immense respect for them because they show up every day, they're great teammates, and they put the work in. Yep. Um, I talk about something, you always hear, uh, I hear a lot of people talk about they want life balance. I want life balance. I believe life balance doesn't exist. I think there's healthy life imbalance and that you've got to compartmentalize at times. I know for me, I talk about it. When I was playing for the uh, New Orleans Saints, uh, my second son, Drake, was uh, he was in the hospital. So I remember going straight from the ball game uh, to sit by his bedside, you know, when he's less than a week old and he's got tubes coming out of his head and everything because he's had multiple surgeries. And I always say, you know what? Had I been on the field and it was life balance and I've got that in my mind and other stuff, I didn't, I didn't believe you could perform. How were you able to compartmentalize? Because it sounds like that's what you did, even if you weren't saying it, that you were able to fully and, and, and completely focus in the moment. You know, it's hard to pinpoint. I, I don't know if you're just born with it, um, but when I was in a co competitive situation, I could just shut everything else off. Right. So when I got to the field um, on game day on Sunday, you know, Jeff Eagles used to call it the three hour club. Yep. And um, three hours on Sunday, three hours on Sunday. That's all I, you know, and then I implemented the, the, the earplugs. Oh, did you? Um, okay. I started that in New York. Um, it was great. You know, Jeff had done it his whole career. I think John Casey did it. Mm -hmm. It was great because I could talk to you right now if I had them in, but it, it gave me a, uh, a deeper like focus on game day. Okay. To, it just blocked out. And Jeff introduced them to me, and I wore them my whole rest of my career. Um, Interesting. But I was just able to really, I mean, three hours is not a long time to tell yourself to, <laughs> yeah, to focus. absolutely. And they're paying you pretty good wages for it. So um, I really took it about as serious as you can anything. And I thought it was pretty easy to, to lock in for three hours on game day. And not only that, but I mean, as you know, like we talked about earlier, you have to lock in at practice. Yeah. Uh, for no us, question. there are no throwaway plays. I mean, I may get 15 live reps in front of the team, maybe right. on the high end during yeah. the week. Mm -hmm. And I want to make every one of those kicks in mm -hmm. front of my teammates. Yeah. Um, so we can go miss off to the side whenever we're just working or working on something. But right. uh, I felt like the week prepared me as a kicker or punter, especially. I think the week prepares you even more so than probably most everyone else because we have to be perfect. Yeah, we do well. Well, and I would say this though, for me, I talk about I can't be perfect because I can always throw the ball quicker, or, or yeah. even more accurately. But I'm paid to be consistent, which is I've got I've got to I've got to hit a certain area and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And for you, I mean, to a degree, you're, you're paid to be perfect to get it through the uprights. But every single one could be higher or stronger or faster. Yeah, straighter, but yeah. but in general, you're you're paid to be consistent. I think you you hit it like I think your career like 81 and a half percent. Yeah. It's pretty damn. I round good. up to 82. Is 80 Two percent is yeah, what I, go, I was going I go to say. The half. Folks, it, it was eighty-two percent. The math rules. The, no, the, yeah. <laughs> the math rules are you go to the next one. So, how, how about through your career? You, you mentioned Fegels a little bit. You mentioned Morton, and he's in the Hall of Fame, and some other people. Uh, just some people that maybe you got something uh, got something from through your career, either be before it started or during. Who were some people that had an influence on you? Well, uh, you know, one of the guys is someone. The, nobody's ever heard of his name's Glenn Harper he was a punter in Canada really? um, Glenn played like 21 years uh, he was he played at Washington State okay um, he was a great athlete great golfer um, he really settled me down after I had been cut twice I get mm -hmm. to Ottawa and I'm on this team and, and again the CFL had not used kickers from America in okay. a long long time yep and so I think Al Saunders knew somebody, so they recommended me. So I really kind of went up there on a Thursday and played on a Saturday. It was that quick. But I meet, you know, Glenn Harper, and uh, he's a great athlete. And he just uh, – he had a way about him, how he prepared. He was playing for the love of the game, essentially, because you don't make a ton of money in Canada. I mean, enough right. to live on. But yep. um, 
I just spending a year and a half with him was um, he reminded me of Fiegel's. So then okay. he, he had this, you know, Jeff has a way about him. There's a reason Jeff played 22 years. He was yep. fun loving, uh, great teammate, great dude. But on Sunday, man, he, he locked in. The earplug, he, he did a lot of things. Jeff was very instrumental in my career, uh -huh. you know, about the earplugs, preparation. So those are the things you learn as you guys. It's funny that I'm mentioning two punters, right? Right. Because um, you do go to camp and compete with guys, but nobody's really sharing anything with you. You can watch no, how somebody yeah. prepares. Right. Uh, but Morton was left-footed, so I never watched him. Um, yeah, right that, that's interesting. You know, yeah. I mean, I just, I just never watched him. But other than that, it was just... I, the punters were kind of your liaison because they were the ones that, you know, for me that had, you know, Glenn played 20 years in the CFL and Jeff played 22 years. Right. So those were guys I would lean on and they would kind of talk about maybe some kickers that they played with. Yep. And give you a little bit of something. Yeah. Cause they're, you know, they're your sense. caddy, right? They, yep. they, they know what it sounds like when you, when you're hitting the ball well. And so, um, Probably Fiegels and, and Glenn Harper, and obviously some co I have great coaches, right. you know, with Frank Gans Jr. and then you know Tom Quinn in New York, who yep. I'm really close with, and then T Mac. Oh yeah, you know, uh -huh. T Mac Smith. was the reason I went to New York when I got traded. You know, Carl Peterson kind of gave me like a a three team option. Really? Yeah, we actually did. I think it's the second time I ever talked to him. He goes, "Hey, we're going to trade you," and I said, "Well, great, thanks," because I wanted to be traded. <laughs> and uh, he goes, "It's New Orleans, Houston, or New York." And he basically said, which one do you want to go to? Well, you know, th that's actually kind of nice because that doesn't it happen cool. very often. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I've obviously seen him since then and thanked him for everything. But yep. um, New York, I went to New York because um, T-Mac was there. Really? He was with us here yep. briefly. Uh -huh. He was my special teams coach in NFL Europe. Okay. He's now the special teams coach again in New York after kind of bouncing around. But he, okay, we, were, know that. we were together for our first Super Bowl. Wow, that's pretty um, cool. So T-Mac and I are really close. We're like family. So those guys all have a, had an influence on me. Very cool. Okay, so uh, you've had a lot of big kicks in your career. Probably the two biggest are the 07 and the 11 uh, NFC Championship games. Uh, both, you kick a field goal in overtime to win, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 131 yards. The other one, I think, 47. Yep. All right, here goes Tynes again from 47 yards to kick the Giants to the Super Bowl. Snap is good. Kick on its way. End over end. Does it have the distance? It is good. good! Yeah! Lawrence Tynes has kicked the Giants to the Super Bowl. Still maybe the longest in Lambeau? Still is. Uh, in playoffs, is that correct? Yeah, I was... Uh... Dan Bailey had a kick, I don't know, a couple of years ago in the playoffs, and it was like 49, and... I don't ever want anyone to miss in the playoffs, <laughs> but uh, I was sitting there going, "No, Dan, you don't really." It was the it was the the, the Des Bryant catch game, yeah, which they ultimately lost, but uh, it got blocked. So, oh, so you still have it? <laughs> well, I still have it. I'm hanging on. It, it's kind of bizarre to me to think that as many times as the Packers are in the playoffs, right? No one's ever kicked a field goal that long. Yep. In Lambeau Field. Well, I mean, the temperatures are rough. It's it's challenge. I mean, January that ball is. doesn't. Yeah, it, it's that that ball doesn't compress as well. No, it and, does not. Uh, so that that's something. You know, talk about that. I mean, you know, take me through one or both of those kicks and and what you're thinking. No, I mean, you you lock in. You try to make sure it's the same thing. But you know it's to win the game, right? Yeah. You know, I, I'll i take you all the way back to the first quarter, So or pregame. So we go out for pregame, Jeff and I. We can only do five or six pregame kicks. As you know, you're going to do sometimes in the low 20s, mm -hmm. you know, 11 or 12 on each side. Yep. Jeff couldn't catch the ball. His hands were frozen. It was minus 20, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we just hung it up. And Jeff looked at me and he goes, hey, Lawrence, uh, have you noticed that there are no Green Bay Packers out here? <laughs> and I said, you know what, Jeff, I haven't. But now that you mention it, we're the, we're the idiots. <laughs> but I, I just felt like I wanted to get out there and kick in that a little bit. So first quarter, we go down, drive, kick a field goal. Second quarter, I kick a field goal. I'm feeling really good. I mm -hmm. mean, any field goal, one was like 29 and 37, uh, which are not gimmies right. in Lambeau when it's minus 28 wind chill. So, you know, fast forward to the second half, you know, I have a miss in the late in the fourth, middle of the fourth quarter. Um, but I hit it so good. I hit it about as good as you can hit a ball. And I just missed a left. So for me, again, like I told you earlier, I didn't care. Right. Um, I took something out of that. I was like, I hit that really good. I can make a 50-yarder if right. they need it. Interesting. So the end of regulation, a lot, a lot of things were off. And I'm not a finger pointer, but because I'm done, it, the snap was really bad. 
Jeff leaves his feet to go get it. Uh-huh. As you know, that's not good. It is not good. Not, especially on a game winner. I'm, hap- when it's- I'm happy to say that I never gave anybody a snap like oh, that I, in 15 I know that. years. I know that. <laughs> uh, you're, still, you're still the best guy we ever had. So that messes everything up. And when it's minus 28, everything's got to be perfect. Yeah. So that stunk. It sucked. We're going to OT, and we have to kick off. Right. So Brett Favre, I'm like, damn it. You know, hopefully we can make a play here. And then Corey Webster makes a play, um, picks Favre off on that first possession. Mm-hmm. We go three and out. I'm on the field. I mean, it's it's kind of become this legendary story. But I, I had missed twice. I right. made two, missed two. And I wanted to go show coach. So I, when that ball hit the ground on that drop third down, I was the only one on the field. Lined up, got my spot. Look over, no one's out there. Literally, almost. You know, I'm start trying on the field. Jeff comes on. I was ready. I had to show coach I was ready because I didn't. I knew it was forty something. I wasn't real sure of the right. total number, but believe it or not, the miss in the fourth quarter of forty three yards gave you told me, told me I could make that kick. I just yep. started a little bit further right. Yep. So we go out there. We get a great operation, and we made the kick. And so um, I'm glad I did because I probably be at the bottom of the Hudson River right now. Yeah, exactly. You know, but that's really a great that's a great metaphor uh, for, for a lot of people in terms of, okay, if you're confident and you know you can do something, you make sure and let everybody else that you know as well. you got to show your teammates. Absolutely. Yeah, because if I would have been sitting over there with, you know, minus 28 with the coat on and and, and then waiting f- to be, Yeah, do you hey, want me in? Because I, I, go, I didn't yeah. want to have the awkward conversation of Coughlin coming over and saying, man, and then, then, there's, then the play clock's running down. There's yep. a lot of – so I yeah. said I, I was in my head. I was solely focused on redemption. Mm-hmm. So I almost was glad that that ball was incomplete on third down. Right. Because I was like, yes. So then I just go out there. I'm, I, you know, I'm halfway between the, the spot and the, and the coaching staff and – Coughlin looked at me and, you know, he, he, he said it to this day. He goes, look, Lawrence showed me that he wanted to kick it. So I said, because he had people on the headset. Yeah, they were saying probably no. no. Yeah, all you the know, coaches. Pin, pin, pin them deep and let's play deep. Coaches were saying right. no, the offensive coordinator. So yep. um, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. But, you know, but this brings to mind also something, you know, uh, er, early in my life, and I don't know if it was my career also, um, you know, the way I talk to myself sometimes, I would never talk to others. I mean, I was kind of hard on myself, and that changed a little bit. But self-talk is so important. I mean, what's going on? They, they say we have fifty to 60,000 thoughts go through our head a, a day. Wow. And and if it's just three or four words, I mean, you've got hundreds of thousands of, of words going through your head. And you can kind of control that and be intentional. It sounds like your positive mental outlook and how you looked at things helped you tremendously in terms of, of getting ready to kick. Yeah, self belief is a powerful tool. Yeah, and I was never afraid to fail. Right. Uh, I know some people. That's play. huge, though. You've, you, I mean, you've got to get in the ring and understand that it's possible. No, sh- you, you have to know it's going to happen. Yeah, it's exactly. going to happen. It's just, do you get up afterwards? And so I was just, you know, some people uh, motivate themselves by being so afraid of failure. Right. I, I went the other way. Is I'm going to do everything I can, and I know at some point I'm going to fail, but I'm not afraid to. And yep. so. That's just kind of how I – and it was the perfect position to play because you're going to fail. Right. Um, no one's ever been 100% in their career kicking footballs. And so I just – that was my mentality. It's still my mentality. Right. Like I'm not afraid to, you know, laugh at myself or – embarrass myself doing something that I've never done before, even now at 41. Well, I'll say this. I mean, <clears throat> you speak your mind. I'm going to tell you folks out there, if you're not follow- following him on Twitter, you need to, because it's a pretty, pretty good, uh, a pretty good follow. You, uh, you've got some, for lack of a better word, you got some really good, smart ass takes that are yes, fun. They're fun. But, but you're having a good time with I it. I am. I, and the thing is I engage the fan and the Twitter right. people and I'm respectful. And even when people talk shit to me, I, I don't care. Like, I'm not going to come at you with some other because right. that's exactly what you want. So I'm not exactly. going to give it to you. But right. there's a lot of cool people out there, man. And and they really have good questions and they just want to interact with the former pro athlete. Right. I right. mean, it's it's fun to me. I That that uh, that social media stuff gets a lot of bad rap. But there's a lot of good out there, too. There is. Absolutely. Everything, everything in moderation yeah. and there's good out of it. No, okay. So I'm going to go back to that kick because what I see in my mind also, I watched it, but what I see on the replays is the minute you kicked it, it's like it's, like, it's in. And I just see you running the other way on the field, and you're just like, yes. I mean, you just rose to the occasion. <clears throat> yeah, I knew part of that was excitement, but then the other piece was 
it was cold as hell. And I wanted to get out of there. There is no question that, you know, for the three and a half hours that game yeah. took because of overtime, you're 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 locked in and you're warm and people, you know, that don't know at home, we we have heated benches, which yep. is the only reason you, we survived. Right. But I just couldn't wait to get off that field. Um, <laughs> I knew the trophy was going to be in the locker room. My teammates were going to be in the locker room. It was kind of a cool moment for myself because I got to go – into the locker room mm-hmm. while all the guys were still out there. I literally, and you remember Green Bay, it's a long walk. Yeah, no, to, I, yeah, to absolutely. Your locker room. You go it through is. that little skinny tunnel. And I get in the locker room and I'm literally sitting here, like me and you are, by myself at my locker stall. Wait. And there's nobody in there. <laughs> that's, no, and okay, I'm just kind of like, but it, but it was cool because I got to think about what I just did. I was going to say, you let the moment sink in. And I just was like doing this. And, you know, we're going to the Super Bowl. And then the guys start flowing in, and then you start screwing around and acting the fool. But it was a cool moment for me to get to share it with, you know, think about how I got there. Yeah. You know, because you can think about it, like you said, a lot of things in a short amount of time. And your your life just kind of replays this reel like you see in the movies Right. Uh, in my head real quick. Like mm-hmm. a kid from Scotland that was walk-on, that undrafted to, you know, getting traded. Yep. And... I'm going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, it's I, I, I joke with some of my friends sometimes, and it's like, yeah, you know, growing up uh, in a small town in Rose Hill, and and um, you know, quite honestly, dealing with abuse uh, physically and and emotionally from yeah. my mom and some other stuff. And like, um, go to a small uh, college, like, I always knew I was going to play me in the NFL and 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 play a Super Bowl. It happens all the time. Of course, I'm being facetious. Yeah, I mean, just understanding that. Uh, but you, you truly know, believe that. I believed it yeah. later on, but growing up. Up, I was just, you know, I was, I had so much to learn, and I was really growing up. I was just trying to survive, to be, to be right. honest with you. And then, um, as you look back and you get a little retrospective, you're like, okay, I did some things. Number one, that were pretty cool. I'm not trying to brag about it, but and and maybe that's why we're doing this. Also, is maybe I can communicate something to some other people to help inspire them and, and make them want to go and and be the best they can and not be afraid to throw their hat in the ring and know that they're going to fail. But it's do they get up one more time mm-hmm. uh, than they've been knocked down? I think everyone, is, anyone is capable of anything. Yes. And um, I have twin boys that are 12. I tell them that all the time, and it. Physical size obviously gets you certain places mm-hmm. right now. And I was always the small guy. And I don't know, but I never felt like the small guy. Right. Which was, it's all mental. I, I, it is. And I tell my kids this, it, everything in life is mental. It's all about how you, how do you approach it? What is mm-hmm. your attitude going in? You know, like when my kids come home, they're like, oh, homework again. I'm like, well, you know. How are you going to attack this process right, right now? Like, are you? I said it's going to suck. Your homework's going to suck no matter what if you go at it like that. Right. Like if you just say, "Oh yeah, I can't wait to do my homework," it'll be such a better experience, even though you really didn't want to do it. It's just all mentality. You know what? That, that, that's a, that's a great point because when I when I, uh, it's kind of funny. I think you know I'm a juggler. Some of you oh, yeah. out there don't know I've, I've juggled center ring for Ringling Brothers twice. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm nothing if not a clown. <laughs> but sometimes when I, when I talk to these groups, one thing I do is I give everybody in the crowd. It can be you know 150 people. They all get three scarves, and we learn to juggle. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm giving them a permission. Uh, to not be perfect. I mean, they may fail. They're not going to learn right away, but everybody has the ability. But I'm also wanting to then talk to them afterwards because we only do do it for about five minutes. You know, when I say, okay, everybody, we're going to learn to juggle, you know, you've got some people who are like, wow, this is cool. you got other people who are like, well, okay, well, we'll I see. I can't do that. Yeah. That's the first thing they think. Yeah, then there's other people that are like, oh, this is stupid. And when I get done with it, I was like, okay, who had fun? Who who was so-so? And I asked their, their response. I said, ultimately, um, the, the attitude that you took towards juggling when I said we're going to learn, that's what really shaped your experience before you even got there. And that's what you're telling me Absolutely also right. is, is the meaning that you assign to something. I mean, basically, it's, uh, I mean, focus equals feelings equals your quality of life. What you focus on and the meaning you give it, you know, th- that's your day-to-day uh, quality of life. And, and really, I, I mean, what you're saying is exactly what I try to espouse in everybody I talk to. Well, it's... it's Listen, there's, there's no, uh, it's not a coincidence that me, you, and, and guys mm. that made it and guys that played have a very similar thought process. Yes. And that's true from the quarterback down to the kicker, a punter. Mm-hmm. We all had a, a, a singular focus, obviously, to be great at something, but 
we have a mentality. That's the thing that separates us is I've played against a lot of guys and competed against a lot of guys that were far superior athletically. Right. But they weren't as strong mentally. And it, it, it's, it's the emotional strength that they they, and they, so, pursue, they I mean, have. I, yes. I mean, there's some, sometimes in camp, there was a guy, a kid here in camp, the year I got traded, uh -huh. I can't even think of the kid's name. And he was only here for like OTAs. And he hit, I mean, his leg strength was top five I've seen ever. Mm -hmm. And to this day. And he was gone like two weeks later. But I'm like... You know what? He I don't know why he he was gone, but but again, that's my whole point. There's always guys that are better. I tell my kids that all the time, no matter how good they think they are or their certain sport or something. I said there's always someone better than you. Yep. And I want them to recognize that because then it's going to keep them pushing and wanting to be better at something, if, whatever they choose to do. If it's you know that's interesting. When when I when I talk to groups, one thing that I say almost verbatim all the time is, you know. Physical traits are what we notice most often, but it's the emotional ones that are often overlooked. And when you recognize and foster the emotional strength within someone, including yourself, mm -hmm. you know, that's when you have a chance to reach new heights, I believe. Because as you said, there's always somebody physically that has it better, but it's the mental side of the games. And you said, you know, we're similar uh, in what we do. But the fact is, everybody has the ability to affect their their emotional strength and their attitude. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think it's the easiest thing to, to control. Mm -hmm. We can't control how big and tall we are. Right. We really can't. You can work out and lift, and but you cannot. You know, like Bregman for the for the Astros, mm -hmm. kind of a sour topic right now with that team. But like, what is he five six? Right. He's one of the best third basemen in the world. And it just goes to show you, he you can watch him. I can watch him when he's playing, and I've never met him. And I look at him, I'm like, he's got it. He yep. just the way he carries himself, and you can see his focus. Right. I I just think that the mental part is the one thing we can all control. Yep. Um, some will be better than others. You cannot control how tall, how strong. I mean, you, you can't control your physical attributes outside right. of strength. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can lift and and do all that thing, those things, but. I think it is these things. It's the one thing I think why uh, I think kicking in general right now in college is horrible. Uh, I I watch these kids and I think physically they they test well because every kid gets a scholarship now because they went to a camp and kicked a sixty five right. yarder. Mm -hmm. But you know um, if we could have got inside people's head like Mahomes, Mahomes would have clearly been the number one pick if you truly knew what he was made of. Yep, you know that's a good and point. then Trubisky. Wouldn't have even been a first rounder. I, I just don't know how we start to evaluate right. mental. Um, I think there's silly tests and all that stuff, but I think it just takes spending time with somebody. Well, I was going to say, and so the, isn't that? And you, if I talk about leadership, that's a good trait of a leader is being willing to sit down with somebody and try to understand them as a person, what's going on in there, and not just looking at the the check the boxes thing that they can do, big, strong, fast, or whatever. It's it's like okay, emotionally, how's he going to react? Is that a fair statement? Hundred percent. The people always ask me the question. You probably get this. Who's the best player you ever played with? And I'm like, it, it, the easy answer would be Michael Strahan, right? Uh -huh. Or Tony Gonzalez or mm -hmm. Will Shields or Eli, any name. The best player I ever played with is a guy named Chase Blackburn. And Chase Blackburn played 10 years in the NFL. He was a core special teamer, captain. He could snap. He could have played in the NFL as a snapper. He played goal line tight end. He played linebacker. He started in our second Super Bowl. He started games. He's the best player. He He... He's now the special teams coach at Carolina. Okay. At like, you know, early 30s. He just was an instant coach, but he is truly the best player in terms of he had this mentality of he was undrafted out mm -hmm. of Akron, ran a five flat. He was the first guy down the field on kickoff. Coach used to show it all the time on film. He knew everyone's 40 times on our kickoff team. Chase was obviously the slowest by a huge margin. Right. He was always the first one down the field. Mm -hmm. That's a mentality. Yes. It's a mentality. He's, he's the slowest guy on the, the other 10. And, um, I was faster than him. But he was the first guy down the field because he just want to to get down there and make that play. Right. Um, and then he, he just did anything you could do, like offensively, defensively. He To me, it's weird. I know it. he's the best player I've ever played with. Right. Um, football player. Mm -hmm. now, not, not necessarily the most talented guy, but right. um, he just had a way about him. And he just... It was all mentality for him. He really? had to be. When you're 6'5", 250, right. and you run a 5'1", yep. you're not getting drafted.
No. You're going to have to go prove it. You're going to have to prove it, absolutely. Okay, so Lawrence Tynes, you have your career. Uh, it ended w one year in Tampa. That was n not a great yeah. experience. And, and, you know, really, th that's uh, something if you want to talk about it as well. But, I mean, that's that was a frustrating way to end things. And, um, it, it, you know, if it weren't for probably your emotional strength and how you deal with things and able to kind of segment that a little bit and just kind of, I don't know, parse that from your memory, um it was just not the way you would have envisioned ending it, is it? It wasn't. Um, it was just a, the whole thing was just a bad, bad, bad experience. I mean, everything happens for a reason. Um, I was not, you know, I was upset to some degree, but um, you got to move on. And, exactly. And so I, I wasn't going to there, sit there and have a pity party for myself. Um, it just wasn't able. I wasn't able to kick anymore. Right. Um, so I immediately uh, found work. So I. I, I did take six, I have maybe like nine months mm -hmm. to kind of say, what am I going to do here? Decompress a little. But, and I needed that time because, you know, for a long time, you're, you're kind of in this structured way of NFL life and it's good to kind of take a break. But yep. I, uh, my competitive nature was like, well, what's next? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I found, you know, my job at Wheels Up. Yeah, I was going to talk about that. Wheels Up and, and what that, what's what you're doing now, what you've just done recently. Some pretty cool things and really is a testament to the fact of, okay, it, it's, it's really what me. I, I always tried to say that football is what I do. It's not who I am. And football is not who you are. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, it's what you did for a long time. Now you're doing something else, which I think is tremendously interesting. Yeah, so Wheels Up is a revolutionary kind of, you know, it's a, it's a membership based private aviation solution that was started by a guy named Kenny Dichter six and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. So I was like employee number 16. Mm -hmm. um, we're close to, you know, with the merger, we just bought Delta private jets. We're, we're over 1400 employees. It's crazy. I think we had six planes or something. When I started, we have over 200 planes now. Um, but it, that's my new team. Um, yes. I have a bunch of great teammates. I, it's very similar to a to a football locker room in a, in a weird way because no, I, get I mean that. I now work the the name on the front of my jersey is Wheels Up mm -hmm. and uh, you know I work for them and and I work for my teammates and again the same thing same things hold true there I I want to do my job and I want to I, I do sales mm -hmm. and I and I want to produce and I and I want to help build this company. Uh, because that's the right thing to do. Yep. And, you know, they, they pay you a fair wage to do it, and just like in the NFL. And, you know, we have great teammates. We have a great company. We have a great brand. And, and there's a reason, you know, why Delta just became our largest shareholder mm -hmm. for a startup that's only six and a half years old. That's a big deal to have a flagship airline right. backing you. So we are obviously on the right track. We're doing things the right way, and um, we're trying to change kind of the private aviation landscape. Interesting. Okay, so we, we've been talking for a while. I want to keep you all day. Uh, this is the one thing that I end with each and every time, which is, uh, what is your extra point? And what's one thing that you would say to people that you think can really make a difference with them? And whatever it is, there is no wrong answer. Just wake up and attack every... I think it's mentality. Um, you know, that's the one thing. I, I've got flaws. I've got strengths. But, but the one thing I will always do is have a positive outlook. Mm -hmm. Um, just like you, I've had shit happen in my life. That's not perfect. I mean, you know, my mom it, it died of alcoholism. My brother's in prison. Mm -hmm. Uh, that doesn't define me though. You know, it's, it's, it's part of my story, right. but it's also, uh, you just move on from stuff. And I, and I don't want to say that in a ne negative no, way, I, like, yeah. but I, I am so focused on my personal and mental well-being and being a great dad, husband, you know, that I just wake up and think there's always a, a, a better way to do something. Mm -hmm. Like, I just don't, I don't have negative, I don't have negativity in my life. Like, sure, I get pissed off. Right. But I, if something goes wrong, I'm just like, I always think of why. I don't think of why me. Okay. You know, I, I think, okay, well, let me figure out why did that go wrong. And I, tell, I, I share that with my kids too, as I'm like, well, why? Well, well, something made it go wrong. Right. And then you just figure it out. And then once you do, then you're better for it. And so I just, uh, I just wake up. I, I'm positive. I mean, I'm, I get pissed off like everybody else does. Right. But um, I just look at everybody for their best traits and best qualities. And I look at that like every day. I just try to be 
positive. Well, that's cool. Well, listen, I appreciate you yeah, coming man. on. Absolutely, Great teammates, you know, you as well. And, you know, out there, we appreciate you coming. We'll have another uh, episode coming soon. But this is Lawrence Times, Times two-time uh, two uh, Super Bowl winner. But uh, more importantly, uh, somebody who asks why and, and gets it and uh, believes in a positive attitude. And we will see you next time on The Extra Point.